Four days ago, we marked the 10th anniversary of September 11. And those of you who uh, happened to read the weekend interview in last Saturday's Wall Street Journal uh, know that when uh, news of the attacks that day broke, our luncheon speaker today was at a doctor's office under the protection of a security detail. Uh, hearing news of the attack, he asked the US Marshal attached to him, is this our guys? Uh, by which he meant Al-Qaeda. Our speaker was uh, well aware of Al-Qaeda even then, because six years earlier he presided over the trial of the Al-Qaeda terrorists who attacked the World Trade Center in 1993. Michael Mukasey graduated from Columbia University in 1963 and received his JD from Yale Law School in 1967. From 1972 to 76, he served as assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. In 1987, President Reagan appointed him to serve as a judge on the U in the U.S. District Court of that same district, uh, and, and he remained on that court until 2006. In 2007, President George W. Bush nominated him to become the 81st U.S. Attorney General. And the confirmation process in the Senate, eventually successful, was quite contentious for reasons relevant to the topic uh, he will speak on here today. Uh, that topic is national security in the Constitution in the Obama administration. Please join me in welcoming former U.S. Attorney General Michael Mukasey. Thank you very much for that kind, I should actually say lavish introduction. Um, and also to Hillsdale College for marking Constitution Day, that is the anniversary of the date when the Constitution was ratified uh, with the celebration of the sort that I think those who labored over that Constitution would have been pleased with, uh, that actually involves a serious discussion of what the document uh, says and means. Um, and of course, I'm flattered uh, to be included in such an event. My assigned topic today is, is national security and the Constitution in the Obama administration, or so I was told. Um, and um, I will also take it um, as a given that considering the stature and seriousness of Hillsdale College in dealing with, with issues of this sort uh, by the Constitution, um, you mean the whole Constitution and not just a couple of the amendments to the Constitution that were passed afterwards. Um, there are actually a couple of issues lurking in that. Let's begin with the body of the Constitution, the document whose ratification that we are marking, that you are marking with this celebration. Um, it did not, as you know, include a Bill of Rights at the time that it was ratified, and I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, but I think that the liberties we value are really the result, uh, not so much of their enumeration in the Bill of Rights, uh, passed in 10 amendments later on, but rather of such prosaic features of the Constitution as a bicameral legislature and the separation of powers uh, between and among the three branches of government and between the federal government and the states. Now, I recognize that when people get together to celebrate the Constitution or to have heated arguments about it or uh, to demonstrate and carry placards in favor of adhering to it, um, the provisions that I mentioned are generally not uh, what they have in mind. Um, what they have in mind is, um, is rights. Uh, now that seems odd because um, there were and are in fact other constitutions in the world that guarantee far more in the way of rights than what's set forth in the first ten amendments to our own constitution. Uh, the, uh, the constitution of what we now delicately refer to as the former Soviet Union uh, purported to guarantee far more rights, and not only political rights of all sorts, uh, but also the right to shelter and sustenance and to health care. It's a whole cornucopia of rights. Um, and the Constitution of the European Union uh, purports to guarantee all manner of rights to those who are fortunate enough to live in the EU. Um, um, I hadn't intended that as a laugh line, but... It, uh, uh, but it is, isn't it? Um, 
The trouble is that neither of those constitutions is worth the paper it's written on because uh, the Soviet constitution guaranteed also uh, the supremacy of the Communist Party and failed to include uh, the separation and dispersion of power that characterizes our own constitution, uh, an omission, of course, which made all its other high-sounding provisions completely irrelevant. And so far as the EU constitution is concerned, uh, it too guarantees all manner of rights and provides for their enforcement by the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Uh, that court uh, hears such monumental cases as a claim by someone being evicted from an apartment in Milan that his European right to shelter is being infringed. Um, when I was Attorney General, that court had a backlog of about 300,000 cases. Um, and it has a decision tree that looks like it was, it was designed by Rube Goldberg. Now, there are, there are several of you who don't know who Rube Goldberg is, and I would advise those of you who are that young can use your computers to look him up on Google, and uh, it'll explain to you who he was. Um, and of course, such executive um, power as there is in the EU is reposed principally um, in a whole army of faceless mandarins in Brussels who write regulations. Uh, President Obama campaigned for office substantially on the claim that his predecessor um, had shredded the Constitution. Now, of course, by the Constitution, he didn't mean the document whose ratification we mark today. Uh, he meant, I think, some of the amendments. In fact, he could not have meant the document itself because Article Two of the document uh, begins with the very simple declaration that, quote, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. Notice it doesn't say some of the executive power or most of the executive power or even all but a teeny weeny bit of the executive power. Uh, it says the executive power. Um, in other words, all of it. Uh, this is particularly interesting and noteworthy when you stop and consider that the legislative powers are enumerated. Uh, what's given to Congress is as the Constitution says, all legislative powers herein granted. Oh, I understand that there's a, there's a necessary and proper clause later on, but it's what's necessary and proper to carry into Constitution the powers that are set forth earlier in the list. Um, in other words, the founders understood, based in part on their unfortunate experience under the Articles of Confederation, that when no one was in charge, um, the, the branch of government um, uh, most likely to be in need of the ability to act quickly and decisively is the executive and the branch most likely to overreach unless the subject it could deal with were specifically laid out was the legislature. So President Obama ran for office. When he ran for office, I should say, he could not have meant that his predecessor shredded the document whose adoption that we're here to commemorate because the real criticism he was leveling uh, insofar as it relates to the actual Constitution uh, seems to be that his predecessor took it too seriously. Well, um, all of that ended on January 20th of 2009, um, or did it? We had a series of executive orders aimed mainly at undoing the policies that had been put in place that were within the control of the executive before that. So we had an order uh, directing that Guantanamo be closed within a year. Um, as you will recall, uh, we celebrated the second anniversary of that order in January of 2011. Um, um, and I think we can all agree uh, that wherever that celebration was held, it was a whole lot quieter uh, than the one that we're holding today. Um, even though the principal planner of the September 11, 2001 attacks, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, had announced that he was ready to plead guilty before a military tribunal at Guantanamo, um, and even though he was in the custody of the Department of Defense, it was the Justice Department that announced in November of 2009 uh, that his military commission was canceled and in, instead uh, he would be brought to the mainland United States to stand trial in my old court, uh, the Southern District of New York. Um, of course, that worked out too. Um, <laughs> indeed, uh, Congress passed a statute uh, relying on its constitutionally enumerated powers of the purse, directing that no federal funds be used to bring any detainee at Guantanamo to the United States, with the result that the military commission trial for KSM and the other detainees charged in connection with the September 11 attacks is back on. 
However, the process has had to start again from scratch. So here, a few days after we commemorated another anniversary, a very somber one, and several years after we actually took custody of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Ramzi bin al-Sheib, and the other defendants who were to be tried with them, there is still no date set for the commencement of that proceeding. And paradoxically, after Congress passed that legislation, um, the administration complained that, that it was an interference with the prerogative of the executive to choose the forum for the presentation of charges. Late conversion. Um, we had another executive order in January of 2009 uh, suspending the CIA interrogation program as an affront, among other things, to the Constitution. Uh, indeed, the mantra at the time was that uh, these executives' orders in the large were meant to restore standards of due process and the Constitution. Um, instead of these allegedly disgraceful and unlawful interrogation techniques, the world, uh, including our adversaries, uh, were told that anyone acting on behalf of the United States government, whether a highly trained CIA operative seeking the most sensitive security-related information, or the most junior recruit in the field interrogating someone he's just captured, uh, is limited by the Army Field Manual, which, because it was drafted for general use, is, of course, pitched to the capabilities of the most junior recruit in the field, and has, in fact, been available on the internet for years and has been used by terrorists for years as a training manual for resisting interrogation. A brief word about that abandoned CIA program, which involved um, in what is probably the most disastrous marketing uh, since New Coke, um, something, something called enhanced interrogation techniques, um, which were actually not only harsh and coercive, which is what they should have been called, uh, but also completely lawful. Um, people other than those who debriefed the detainees were schooled in those techniques, and when detainees uh, subjected to them, who necessarily self-selected as a group because they were both knowledgeable of al-Qaeda and resistant to lesser techniques, when those detainees agreed to be compliant, other, other agents knowledgeable in the background of al-Qaeda resumed the interrogation. We learned a great deal through the CIA program. In fact, you can focus on only three of the detainees, Abu Zubaydah, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and a man named Abdul Rahim al-Nashiri, um, who are the only three who were subjected to the most famous of these techniques, which is waterboarding, um, and see a huge trove of valuable information. Um, with respect to waterboarding, by the way, I should, given the fact that th only three detainees were subjected to it, and the number of journalists who have written that they were subjected to it and claimed that it was torture, it would appear that more journalists have been waterboarded than terrorists. <laughs> um, not that that's a bad thing. Um, some of what we learned from Abu Zubaydah, according to uh, George Tenet and General Michael Hayden, both of whom were uh, sequentially uh, directors of the CIA, uh, is information that led to the arrest of Ramzi bin al-Sheib, who was a link to the higher-ups for 9-11, and was planning an, air, an, an airplane attack on Canary Wharf and Heathrow Airport in England. Uh, the arrest of Jose Padilla, known for, probably best known for a fanciful plot to construct a dirty bomb, but who actually planned to acquire apartments uh, in apartment buildings, fill them with gas, seal them up, um, and detonate them uh, with a cell phone. Um, and was convicted of that. Uh, we also learned that al-Qaeda recruits, and this was a valuable piece of information from Abu Zubaydah, that al-Qaeda recruits were trained to resist to the limit, but that doctrinally and religiously it was then okay for them to talk once they had served uh, their obligation by reaching the limit of their uh, physical ability. And that valuable lesson was applied to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who when he reached his limit uh, became virtually a tutor not only did he disclose general information on how al-Qaeda moved money and people, but also specific information that helped disrupt other plots, including one involving airplanes, this one directed at the uh, library tower in Los Angeles that was to be carried out by a South Asian group headed by a man named Hambali, who was also arrested based on his information. Uh, other information 
uh, received from KSM resulted in the capture of people involved in a plan to develop a biological weapons capability in the United States and on and on. And as to Abdul Rahim al-Nashiri, the third person who was waterboarded, he was the mastermind of the attack on the coal uh, and was providing stale information until after these techniques were applied, at which point his information became both current and useful. Uh, not only has this interrogation program been abandoned, but when people apprehended in connection with terrorist plots directed at this country, and there have been more than 20 since 9-11, more than a dozen of them aimed at my hometown, New York alone, uh, when people have been apprehended in connection with those plots, even though their principal value once they're in custody is as sources of intelligence, they've almost uniformly been told, per, turned over immediately to law enforcement authorities, warned of their Miranda rights, and treated as routine criminal suspects. What did we, what did we lose in the process? Um, what we lost when the questioning of uh, a man named Umar Abdul Muttalib, who was the, recall he was the bomber apprehended, or the would-be bomber apprehended over Detroit um, in, on Christmas Day of 2009. Um, when that plot was interrupted, um, what we lost was information about who had built his bomb. Um, information, if it had been followed up promptly, might well have erased that bomb builder. Um, when bombs started showing up in packages, um, in, in uh, DSL packages and uh, packages on other package by other package carriers, United Parcel and so forth, um, originating in Yemen, uh, it appeared that the person who built Abdul Muttalib's bomb was still at large. Uh, those bombs were of the same sort that Abdul Muttalib tried to detonate uh, and appeared to be the work of the same bomb maker. Lest anyone think that this bomb maker has never had a success, or at least an even nearer success than he had with Abdul Muttalib, you should be aware that he is believed to be the same person uh, who sent his own brother with a bomb on his person to meet as a penitent with Prince Mohammed bin Nayef, who was largely responsible for running Saudi Arabia's counterterrorism activities. That bomb, uh, which was concealed um, in the rectum of the person who carried it, did go off, uh, but it only injured bin Nayef rather than killed him. And yet, um, as I indicated before, Guantanamo remains open. And despite concern for what were referred to during the campaign as constitutional standards, by which was meant, I think, uh, standards allegedly applicable based on amendments to the Constitution, uh, the administration has acknowledged that one of its options is indefinite detention of anyone deemed too dangerous to release, but as to whom there is not enough evidence of war crimes to bring a charge before a military commission. Now, although the facility remains open, it's also true that the president remains as committed as ever to closing it. Uh, for starters, uh, no new detainees are being brought to Guantanamo. So we learned a month or two ago that a man named Warsami was apprehended and was thought to be in possession of valuable intelligence. He was placed aboard a naval vessel, debriefed for two months, after which he was advised of his Miranda rights and brought to trial and brought to the United States for trial. Uh, he was not brought to Guantanamo because Congress has directed that no funds can be used to bring anyone from Guantanamo to the United States. And the administration doesn't want to try him before a military commission because it disdains military commissions, notwithstanding that they've been used before in our history from, rev from the Revolutionary War through and including World War II and are provided for specifically in a statute passed by Congress called, as you would expect, the Military Commissions Act. And of course, the administration remains as committed as ever to figuring out a way of releasing those detained there, despite a growing body of evidence that alumni of Guantanamo, when they get out, return to the battlefield. Um, one relatively recent example is an interview uh, with a man named Sheikh Abu Sufyan al Azdi, deputy commander of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Those are the folks based in Yemen, uh, published in the October 2010 issue of that organization's English language magazine called Inspire. Now, for those of you who don't have a subscription uh, to Inspire, um, I should tell you that you can get a copy of the interview through uh, a site called the Middle East Media Research Institute, or MEMRI, which is a wonderful service that really deserves your attention and support, and you can get their reports uh, online for nothing. Um, in, in this interview, Abu Sufyan, who was released from Guantanamo, and turned over to, to the Saudis for participation in their 
vaunted re-education program, uh, managed to make his way to Yemen, resume his jihadi activity. Um, in this interview, he urges Muslims to emulate, emulate Nidal Hassan, uh, the Fort Hood shooter, and Abdul Muttalib, the, Detroit, the would-be Detroit airplane bomber. This is, of course, by no means the first alumnus of Guantanamo to return to the battlefield. Uh, back in March 2010, the supreme leader of the Afghan Taliban announced that he was promoting a man named Mullah Abdul Qayyum Zakir to replace a top deputy who had been captured by U.S. forces. Zakir had also been in, in detention in Guantanamo and released to the Afghans. In fact, at least 20% of those released from Guantanamo have returned to the battlefield. And of course, those are only the ones we know about uh, because they've been recaptured or killed. How many are still in the fight is really anyone's guess. Now, a few words about Guantanamo itself. Um, it's a military facility, not a CIA facility. Uh, I visited it in, in February of 2008. Uh, it is a state-of-the-art facility. It compares favorably uh, with medium security facilities, forget maximum security, but medium security facilities that I had the occasion to visit when I was a district judge in New York, uh, medium security facilities in the federal system. Um, um, I saw when I visited there most of the high value detainees on closed circuit television, uh, which is the way they were monitored, other than Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was out of his cell speaking with a visiting delegation from the International Committee of the Red Cross, um, presumably to tell them of all the horrors to which he had been exposed. Uh, but I did manage to visit his cell uh, and discovered that adjoining it uh, was an exercise room uh, that featured an elliptical machine that was the same make and model as the one that I used at the gym in the Landsberg Apartments where I lived when I was Attorney General. Um, the courtroom at Guantanamo uh, is enormously expensive it can handle high security de detainees and secure information direct from the mainland via computer. The medical care that's given to detainees there is better than the care that's given to their captors. The library includes many Islamic and other titles, as well as DVDs. Uh, as it happens, the most popular item when I was there were DVDs of a program called Walker, Texas Ranger. Um, that's not to say that there isn't violence at Guantanamo, there's plenty of it, but it's directed by the detainees at their guards, not the other way around. Uh, I saw the plastic face shields that guards have to wear to protect them against the cocktails of urine and other solids and fluids that are thrown at them when they get anywhere near the cells. I should add that this itch to release detainees from Guantanamo, despite a professed willingness to entertain the possibility of indefinite detention, not only is not dictated by the Constitution or any of its amendments, it isn't dictated by the laws of war. Uh, in fact, it turns out, it turns those laws on their head. Um, what it says in essence is that if you obey all the laws of war that humankind has developed over the last several hundred years in order to try to civilize combat to the extent possible, that is if you carry your arms openly, you wear a uniform, you follow a recognized chain of command, and you don't target civilians, you can be detained until hostilities cease. Uh, but what the administration appears to be saying is that if you disobey all of those laws, then we've got an even better deal for you. Uh, we'll bring you to an Article III court in the United States, if we can, uh, get you a lawyer, the benefit of rules designed for routine crimes, as well as a platform to express your views, and if we can't do all that, we'll release you, um, which is about as impressive a set of perverse incentives as you could possibly come up with. So with all this to and froing, as between the two political branches of government and the courts, where do we stand? Well, the intelligence gathering techniques that were adopted and followed during the preceding administration remain not only on the books, but actively pursued. And although we've had attacks here, both attempted and accomplished, we've had nothing on the scale of September 11. And of course, thanks to a vigorous and courageous exercise of the Article II power of the Commander in Chief, and the splendid and courageous performance of a team of Navy SEALs, Osama bin Laden is dead. Now, I certainly would not minimize that achievement. He needed killing, badly, and he and we needed that it be done at the hands of Americans, and it was. And it was done in a way that allowed us to exploit the trove of electronic and written intelligence that was found in his home. Although one could wish that less had been said at the time 
uh, about that trove because once it was disclosed, you can bet that every terrorist who had contact with him or that location made adjustments in his circumstances and routine. Um, and of course, his death has great symbolic significance because he had attained, by the time of his death, to totemic significance, certainly at least from the 10 years after September 11, 2001. But it's impossible to gauge the significance of his death unless and until we recognize the simple fact that our encounter with Osama bin Laden uh, and with what he stood for and its encounter with us uh, did not begin on September 11, 2001. What he stood for was Islamism. And as a matter of history, Islamism, insofar as it holds this country in a kind of weird combination of awe and contempt, has been incubating for about as long as we've known about the other two isms that we successfully conquered in the last century, fascism and communism. As a movement distinct from the religion of Islam itself, Islamism traces back to Egypt in the 1920s when the loosely organized Muslim Brotherhood was established by a man named Hassan al-Banna, a primary school teacher. Al-Banna founded the Muslim Brotherhood as a reaction to the modern, modernizing influence of Kemal Ataturk, who had dismantled the shell of what was left of the Muslim Caliphate in Turkey, had banned fezes and headscarves, and dragged his country by the lapels, and it had to be lapels because nobody was allowed to wear robes, uh, into the 20th century. Albana's principal disciple was also an educator, a bureaucrat of the education department of the Egyptian government named Sayyid Qutb, who caused enough trouble in Egypt to get himself awarded a traveling fellowship in 1948 which was the year that Albana was killed in violence generated by the Muslim Brotherhood. That fellowship was intended to have the benign effect of getting him out of the country. Um, and it did, of course, have that effect, but regrettably for us, um, he chose to travel to the United States, uh, in a particular to Greeley, Colorado. Now, I think that would probably be hard to imagine a more inoffensive place uh, than, than post-World War II Greeley, Colorado. Uh, but for a man like, like Syed Qutb, it was Sodom and Gomorrah. He hated everything he saw, American haircuts, enthusiasm for sports, jazz, what he called the animal-like mixing of the sexes even in church. Uh, his conclusion was that Americans were, in his words, numb to faith in art, faith in religion, and faith in spiritual values altogether. And he said that Muslims must regard, as he put it, the white man, whether European or American, as our first enemy. He said Muslims must make this the cornerstone of our foreign policy and national education. Well, Qutb went back to Egypt, quit the civil service, joined Hassan al-Banna's Muslim Brotherhood. Qutb and the Muslim Brotherhood continued to agitate for a return to fundamentalism in Islam. They welcomed Nasser's coup against the corrupt monarchy uh, in 1952, but then became disillusioned when Nasser, with Nasser when he not only failed to institute Sharia law, he didn't even ban alcohol. Uh, uh, opposed Nasser, was arrested and tortured. However, he continued to write and to agitate uh, against Western civilization, uh, particularly against Jews, who he blamed for atheistic materialism and said were to be considered the worst enemies of Muslims. He was released for a time, but eventually was rearrested, convicted of conspiracy against the government, and hanged in 1966. Many members of the Brotherhood fled to Saudi Arabia, where they found refuge and ideological sustenance. Qutb's brother was among those who fled, and he taught the doctrine in Saudi Arabia. Among his students were a man named Ayman al-Zawari, an Egyptian who had become a leading al-Qaeda ideologist and is now, according to reports, the leader of al-Qaeda, and a then obscure young fellow named Osama bin Laden, the pampered child of the rich, one of the richest construction families in the country. Um, and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, that history did not come to these shores, as I indicated, on September 11, 2001, or even on February 26, 1993, when a truck bomb went off in the basement of the World Trade Center, killing six people, wounding hundreds, causing millions of dollars in damage in what would eventually become known as the first World Trade Center bombing. Rather, it came at the latest in the 1980s, when a couple of FBI agents spotted a group of men taking what looked to them to be particularly aggressive target practice at a shooting range out in Calvert and Long Island. When they approached those men, they were accused of what we now call profiling uh, and backed off. In November of 1990, one of those men, El Said Nosser, 
would assassinate a right-wing Israeli politician named Meyer Kahana in the ballroom of a Manhattan hotel. The case was treated by the Manhattan DA, Robert Morgenthau, as the lone act of a lone gunman. When the 1993 World Trade Center bombers demanded freeing Nosair from jail, it became apparent that the Kahana assassination was not the lone act of a lone gunman. And when authorities reviewed the amateur videotape of Kahana's speech that night, um, the night that he was killed, it was discovered that one of those 1993 bombers had been in the hole at the time. Um, and that another was supposed to be driving what was to be the getaway car. The man who served as the spiritual advisor to Nosair, to the 1993 Trade Center bombers, and who would later issue from jail the fatwa that authorized the 2001 attacks, Omar Abdul Rahman, the so-called blind sheikh, along with Nosair and several others, were tried before me and convicted for participating in a conspiracy to conduct a war of urban terror against this country that included the Kahana murder, the first Trade Center bombing, and a plot to blow up other landmarks around New York to assassinate Hosni Mubarak when he visited the United Nations and other acts. The list of unindicted co-conspirators in that case included Osama bin Laden, the pampered rich kid who had studied at the knee of Syed Qutb's brother uh, in Saudi Arabia. The government was required in that case, as it is in all criminal cases, where there's a conspiracy count to serve a list of unindicted co-conspirators on the defense. And we later found that 10 days after that list was served, it made its way to Khartoum, where um, uh, bin Laden was then in residence. Uh, and so he learned not only that we knew about him, but who else we knew about as well. At the time, all of this was treated as a series of crimes, unconventional crimes maybe, but merely crimes. In 1996 and again in 1998, bin Laden declared that he and his cohorts were at war with the United States, declarations that were treated as quaint and got very little serious attention. In 1998, our embassies in Nairobi, Kenya, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, were almost simultaneously bombed. And again, the criminal law was invoked with the usual mantra of bring them to justice. This time, in fact, an indictment was filed in the Southern District of New York that named bin Laden as a defendant. Apparently, he was unimpressed, or at least undeterred, because in 2000, his group, Al-Qaeda, bombed the USS Cole in Aden, Yemen, killing 16 US sailors, and would have carried out another bombing of another naval vessel called the USS the Sullivans, but for the fact that the barge carrying the explosives was overloaded and sank. And then, of course, came September 11, 2001. And to the call, bring them to justice, was added the call, bring justice to them. And so we were told that we were at war, which was more than 50 years after Syed Qutb determined that Islamists would have to make war on us, about 15 years after Islamists had made it clear that they were training for war with us, and five years after Osama bin Laden made it official with a declaration of war. In fighting Islamism, we are handicapped at the strategic level in no small measure by the refusal of many of those in authority to acknowledge the goals of our adversaries. Those goals are essentially political and involve the recreation of the Islamic Caliphate and the imposition of Sharia law over as broad a swath of the world as possible. This is a profoundly anti-democratic movement at its core and regards the very idea of man-made law as anathema. Instead, we try to be inoffensive by using a term that actually originated in the administration in which I served and we refer to a war on terror or terrorism. People who wish to quibble with what it is we're at war with uh, take the discussion off into absurdity. Uh, if such people were entirely at the periphery, I suppose it wouldn't matter much. But right now, I have to tell you that some of such people are right at the core of where there should be clarity. One of them, in fact, is one of the president's assistants for national security, who actually got up in front of an audience at the Center for Strategic Studies. And this is one of our officially designated deep thinkers talking to other officially designated deep thinkers um, and ridicule the idea of a war on terrorism or terror, saying you can't have a war on a means or a state of mind. Well, that, that actually called to my mind a, a zany British review that ran on Broadway before many of you were born called Beyond the Fringe. And in particular, one sketch from that review uh, involving a, uh, a, a police spokesman for Scotland Yard 
trying to explain to the press why Scotland Yard had not yet solved what was then the great train robbery of 1963. And he said that they had at first been confused by the name great train robbery. Uh, but after investigation, they had found that trains were quite large, they were nearly impossible to conceal, that they ran on rails and so were generally very hard to make off with. So you see, he said, great train robbery is a misnomer. Um, there's no question here at all of a missing train. We, we have the train. It's the contents of the train that are missing. Um, now, now, that review was a farce. Um, but John Brennan, the president's national security expert, did not consider his remarks to the Center for Strategic Studies to be a farce. Um, this failure also distorts the view of policymakers about what's happening in the Middle East. And so they daydream about democratic movements when the reality on the ground is more populist than democratic. The principal beneficiary of populism is more likely to be the Muslim Brotherhood than the local spokesman for Facebook. The credo of the Muslim Brotherhood is succinct, and it is chilling. That credo is as follows. Allah is our goal, the Prophet Muhammad is our leader, the Quran is our constitution, jihad is our way, and death in the way of Allah is our promised end. If the death of bin Laden is more than simply a spasm or an opportunity to engage in self-congratulation, if it helps provide some insight into the nature of what it is we're fighting, into the ism of the current century, then it will have been significant indeed. But if not, its significance will be substantially diminished. The signs do not seem promising. Even on September 11, 2011, as was pointed out by Fuad Ajami, a fellow at the Hoover Institution in Palo Alto and a brilliant observer of these issues, there was no discussion whatever of the people who perpetrated the atrocity. There was only a discussion of the event as if it were like a flood or an earthquake. He pointed in particular to one of the 19, Ziad Jarrah. Jarrah was a Lebanese and the most westernized of the hijackers. Indeed, there was doubt among them almost to the last minute as to whether he would participate. Ajami has pointed out that Jarrah was raised in Beirut and was raised in the cosmopolitan spirit of that city. He then went to Hamburg, Germany, where he was radicalized. It was said of Jarrah that he never missed a party in Beirut, but he never missed a prayer in Hamburg. It was in the West that he was radicalized, just as it was in the West that Nidal Hassan, the Fort Hood shooter, was, radical was radicalized. Jarrah wound up at the controls of Flight 93, the flight that was supposed to hit the capital but didn't, because the passengers aboard that flight learned what had already happened at the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, figured out in a few short moments what was in store for them and their country, and chose to act. There's much to be learned from those facts. Start from the last, which teaches the importance of intelligence. The passengers on Flight 93 were able to act because of what they had learned about what was going on elsewhere. Intelligence gathering must be not only our number one priority, it must be numbers one, two, and three. The people waging war on us, and that is what it is, are part of a movement that does not occupy any particular place or country that we can demolish and pronounce ourselves the winners. They live in some cases among us, and the only way we have of opposing them successfully is to find out in advance what they intend to do and to thwart it. Second, Note that Jarrah was recognized not in the Middle East, was radicalized, I'm sorry, not in the Middle East, but in the West. We must be aware of those in our society who wish to create closed ethnic zones where Muslims may essentially run their own affairs and outsiders enter only at their peril. This has already happened in the suburbs of French cities, in parts of England, in places you ordinarily would not expect it to happen, Malmo, Sweden, for example. That allows radicalization to go on undetected. Guidelines have been put in place to allow the FBI to function for the first time in its history as an intelligence gathering organization and not simply as a law enforcement agency. If the Bureau partners with state and local law enforcement, notably but not exclusively with a police department like the one in New York, which has a robust intelligence gathering capability of its own, uh, then the kind of insular activity that allowed Jarrah to be radicalized can be broken up. Those guidelines must remain in place and must be defended. Doing that will take an intelligent understanding of the part of the Constitution that I have not spoken about at length, the part that many people outside this room think they're talking about when they refer to the Constitution. 
That part, what we call the Bill of Rights, provides robust protection to both public and private activity that we value, that is in fact essential for the continuation of our civic life. But it does not require that we close our eyes when there are people plainly setting the stage for activity that is in no way protected. So the First Amendment protects both free speech and freedom of worship, and it permits the preaching even of violence in the name of religion. But it does not guarantee to anyone that such speech will go undetected or that evidence of it cannot be presented in a court when and if it is appropriate to charge that both the speaker and those to whom he spoke understood this protected speech and took it as a call to unprotected action. Even action that itself consists only of speech, such as agreement to commit a crime, which is itself the crime of conspiracy. And the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. It contains a separate warrant clause providing that warrants may issue only on a finding of probable cause. That does not mean that a search conducted for intelligence purposes requires a warrant, only that it be reasonable. The Fifth and Sixth Amendments guarantee due process and counsel to those accused of crimes and the right to confront witnesses, but their application is limited to criminal trials, which is to say to trials occurring in Article III courts. How much process is due and what kind of evidence may be received and under what circumstances in other tribunals convened for special purposes, such as military commissions, is an entirely different story. With the adoption of the Constitution, the part we mark with today's proceedings, when that was being debated, there were many, including Patrick Henry and other luminaries, who opposed the Constitution because it did not include within the very body of it a Bill of Rights. But if you included within the very body of the document that constituted the government, the rights of citizens against that government, God-given rights no less, the message could be taken essentially as an invitation for everybody to simply go his or her own way. So I would submit to you that a hidden message lurking, as it were, in the structure of the Constitution is that those acting lawfully under it deserve at least the benefit of the doubt when they act to protect the common good. Now that's not meant to be a statement or a suggestion of a jurisprudential standard, a standard of law. But it is meant, and I do mean it emphatically as a prudential standard, a standard of civics and public discourse that I think will help keep intact the system that we and those outside this room depend on to preserve the nation that another lawyer, speaking at another time of trouble, called the last best hope of earth. Words that I submit to you are actually more true today than when Abraham Lincoln first spoke them. I thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm told that um, there was to be a Q&A period. I don't know whether I've spoken over my time to the point where we can't have that or not, but I'm perfectly willing to do it. Uh, there are microphones available to those who have questions, and there's a gentleman with his hand raised. So. Well, the solution is a not to not to not to release them. Um, um, and B, um, I guess the solution is the one suggested in a cable I heard of. I didn't see it, but I heard of it um, when I was Attorney General from somebody in the field um, who said we captured this guy once before. Um, We've just killed him. Could you please not send us any more? <laughs> Afternoon.
engage in hostile acts uh, against our country. We should address the other side, which, for example, the writ of habeas corpus of Americans Um, that's actually a topic of, of some debate. Um, as you know, um, non-citizens who are not detained in this country um, are supposed to have no habeas rights. That changed um, with, the, with the case uh, decided um, in, from Guantanamo in which essentially the Supreme Court said that um, detainees at Guantanamo, regardless of their nationality, um, are entitled to habeas-like rights, um, and it then told, uh, then invited uh, the federal courts to improvise. Um, now, I don't know how many Article III judges or former Article III judges there are in the room, and um, I am second only to several Article III judges in my admiration for the federal judiciary, uh, but I will tell you that when you invite federal judges to improvise, um, many of them will accept the invitation with open arms and being human beings, um, they won't always improvise the same way. And so what we've found in the District of Columbia is that um, people with like cases are getting unlike results and the DC Circuit is having to straighten it all out. Um, we can't and shouldn't have to continue that. So far as though the availability of habeas corpus to US citizens regardless, um, there was a case called Ex Parte Quirin uh, decided um, back in the 1940s when um, two groups of Germans landed off Long Island and off Florida um, and tried to infiltrate this country uh, to conduct sabotage. One of them claimed to be a US citizen. Um, they were permitted uh, to file writs challenging the jurisdiction of the military commission before which they were tried. Um, and they were tried in a military commission in Washington, notwithstanding that the courts were open. Um, and as to the one claiming to be a US citizen, the Supreme Court said that was immaterial, that once somebody had cast in his lot with people who were at war with the United States, he would be treated as somebody at war with the United States. I, I have a question about, about judges themselves. It seems to me that we have, have had so many rulings ever since the original War on Terror started that just go against what the Constitution meant. And I am wondering, is it possible, how hard is it to overturn, for instance, the habeas corpus rule that you just mentioned? Well, um, the ruling uh, I mentioned in the, in the Boumediene case was decided by the Supreme Court of the United States. So that's kind of hard to overturn. Um, the rulings of individual district judges uh, can be overturned by courts of appeal. Um, the one advantage we have in the fact that some of these cases are arising at Guantanamo is that these folks aren't here. Um, once people come to the United States, be they aliens, be they citizens, uh, they have certain rights that engage as soon as they hit these shores. And those include access to federal courts to file all manner of suits, habeas corpus suits, suits challenging conditions of conviction, and so forth, um, which is why uh, Congress has been so resistant uh, to bringing people over uh, from Guantanamo. Um, so far, we've been successful at that. Um, but it's very much a holding action. Um, as, to, as to federal judges, um, the, um, the business doesn't attract shrinking violence. This next question comes from our online audience. Ted asks, how does the executive branch balance its power as commander in chief with congressional authority through funding of the armed forces? Is this tension healthy for justice and self-government? Um, the, the executive, I mean, there has always been um, tension uh, between the executive and the, and the legislative at the they move, they rub against each other like tectonic plates, and that's not abnormal, and it's not necessarily unhealthy. Um, Congress showed recently um, what happens when the executive has a power uh, that Congress believes it's about to misuse in a gross sort of way, and that is 
that it is corrected by the rather crude uh, invocation of the power of the purse to cut off funds. Um, paradoxically, one of the effects of the congressional bill that bars the bringing of anybody from Guantanamo is that it means that at least this administration won't take anybody to Guantanamo because Congress found that they couldn't be trusted with the authority to distinguish between those who could be brought to the United States for trial uh, and those who couldn't. Um, so it's the system we have. Um, it functions, I think, by and large well. And um, I, would, I would not experiment with it in favor of another system. My question is, um, you identified Islam as the, the enemy or the ism of today. I'm wondering if you have any qualifiers for that or if it's your view that all of Islam is No, no, I, I, I was tried to be careful. Um, and if I didn't, um, I really should be sternly rebuked in distinguishing between Islam and Islamism. Those are two very different things. Um, I'm not a theologian. There are reform elements within Islam um, there are people who are really interested in moderate Islam. Um, the trouble is that doctrinally it is very hard to find support for those people and it is certainly hard when our administration, when it conducts outreach, conducts outreach to the loudest voices in the Islamic community who turn out to be people who advocate a much more militant form of religion and a much more ambitious um, political agenda. Um, my own view is we ought to be conducting outreach uh, to people of reasonable view, not to act organizations like CARE and ISNA. Yes, uh, how exactly would, would you clearly define the criteria for deciding whether somebody should be uh, treated as a terrorist and outside the, the normal process of law? How, how would you define that criteria? How would you give instructions to people who would actually have to carry that out in the field? Part of it involves um, circumstances of capture. Uh, part of it involves where they acted. Um, people captured on the battlefield abroad who are planning, or any place overseas who are planning terrorist acts, uh, by and large are not captured under circumstances that permit those who capture them to do things like comply with the federal rules of evidence in gathering evidence that permit them to get a person, uh, a lawyer, um, and give him meaningful Miranda warnings and so forth. Um, those cases are very unsuitable for prosecution in Article III courts. There are cases that are suitable for prosecution in Article III courts, and those can be prosecuted when evidence can be gathered under circumstances that allows compliance with the federal rules of evidence. But you shouldn't have to bring um, a, a soldier over from Afghanistan in order to testify to the circumstances of capture of a terrorist, nor should you require uh, that they do uh, CSI Kandahar um, every time they capture somebody who might conceivably be charged. I think people captured in the United States um, should be seen principally upon their capture as um, people to be um, exploited for intelligence value. And we can worry about trying them um, in civilian courts, um, if possible, um, when, as, and if uh, their intelligence value is exploited. Um, the, um, when, when Abdul Muttalib was captured, um, he committed his crime um, if you recall, in front of a couple of hundred passengers on an airplane. The only thing that would have been lost by simply holding him and interrogating him uh, would have been his confession. Um, given the fact that he committed his crime in front of a couple hundred witnesses, I don't know that we really needed his confession. Um, some intelligent focus on that, I think, would be appropriate. Um, gather intelligence first and worry about intelligence first. Worry about trials later on. General, this morning um, there was discussion about the federal overreach of what should be state jurisdiction in making and enforcing laws. And I know we all as Americans have seen this become um, increasingly imposed in our personal lives. You, someone mentioned light bulbs, but 
I'm more concerned about black blanket <clears throat> vaccine programs that are supposed to be for the common good, but um, federal laws that encroach on everything in our lives that take no respect to the individual. Vaccines is one thing. On, the, on one hand, we're compelled to inject into the bloodstream of children um, things that may or may not be in their best interest, but on the other hand, it's illegal to buy fresh pressed apple cider in the state of Virginia. Um, I mean, these are federal laws and it's it talk about overreach where it used to be something that the states could decide. And then you mentioned, sir, the Fourth Amendment, protection against unreasonable searches. Maybe there's a lot of people in this room that same, saw the same video that I saw where at an airport the TSA was um, doing their unreasonable searches on uh, the body of a three-year-old child who was apparently the only person in the airport that had any common sense. She was screaming, take your hands off of me. And um, <laughs> it's gotten to the point where I feel like we're being groomed for something. I mean, we're, we're accepting uh, you can't buy juice, you have to be vaccinated, you have to be searched at an airport. Uh, what comes next? Is next thing, is it going to be the microchip that everybody feels like, okay, well, now in order to be safe, everyone has to be microchipped. My question to you, sir, is I think the TSA is behaving unconstitutionally, and I've refused to fly since the day these things were implemented, because I know when I get to the airport, I'm bound to get arrested, because I'll refuse both to be nuked and to be felt up. So at what point do we finally address this constitutional issue and is anything about being done about it? Well, um, <laughs> you've, t you've, touched, you've touched on a variety of issues. Um, <laughs> and of course, um, the last thing in the world I want to do is stand up here and defend TSA. Um, I think that um, if we had a program that permitted um, the recruitment of people who know what they're doing, um, we could um, screen passengers, as regrettably we have to, uh, in ways that don't involve what TSA does. Um, Um, I, I suppose I would reverse the roles here for a moment and ask you whether you would want the people who do the searches at TSA to be the folks administering the program you just described. My answer to that question is no. Um, okay. okay. That said, um, I think we need to screen people uh, before they get on airplanes. That was proved on September 11th. And I've had my own, um, I've had my own experiences with, with, um, with screening. When I was a federal judge, um, I traveled with um, a security detail of marshals who carried guns. Um, when I traveled on commercial airlines, more than once, I was picked out for the intensive screening. Um, and so my, the marshals who were with me uh, on the security detail stood by patiently with their guns. Um, <laughs> while I was screened for a nail clipper. Um, it's a paradox. Um, in some ways, it's a farce. But um, it is pretty much only an inconvenience. This will be our final question. It seems to me that President Obama has the solution to the problem of, of uh, ca capturing people uh, when they went in to get Osama bin Laden, they were obviously told to kill him because they could have captured him. And if that oh, I think, work... I think, in fairness to them, I think they were probably told that if he unambiguously well, offered to surrender, then they should bit... accept his surrender. I, I somehow doubt that he unambiguously offered there to surrender. There was a little latitude there. But the other thing is you just send a UAV after them and we don't have any capture problem. Yeah, no, neither do we get any intelligence. Um, they're in the problem. 
And um, I find it paradoxical that people who object on humanitarian grounds to detaining people um, think absolutely nothing of dropping a UAV on them um, and uh, ending their lives and the lives of anybody around them. Uh, not a whole lot of due process involved in that, is there? 